So well, uh, now is now is the turn of uh, Mrs. Julia Mezzasalma from Red Italy, who is going to present uh, installation and monitoring system and performance appraisal in real demo buildings. Uh, uh, Julia, the turn is yours. Uh, thank you, Emil. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes. Correct. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, hi to everybody. My name is uh, Julia Mezzasalma. I'm an energe uh, energetic engineer and I work from an Italian SME uh, uh, RED, SRL, that, uh, uh, that work in an efficiency monitoring system and is part of uh, several projects, uh, European projects. So uh, what time I'm going to talk? Uh, I will start uh, to present the four real demo site we are, uh, where we have uh, installed all the um, uh, new products uh, developed uh, during the in we project. Uh, the ethics one, the ventilated facade, the ceiling uh, radiant panel, and the uh, uh, WGP. Then I will show the monitoring campaign in real demo site uh, and uh, the results. Let's uh, start uh, to talk about the demo site. The, the first one uh, is a pilot, a pilot house in the Senar area of Padua in Italy. The second one uh, is the older city hall of Vula Municipal Athens in Greece. The third one is a Echo House residential in Mechelen, Belgium. And uh, uh, the fourth one is a residential care center of uh, Don Orione in Bucharest, Romania. The first one, the pilot house, is a uh, 65 one floor house in the uh, um, research area of Padua. It's made of lightweight prefabricated construction. Here we have installed in three different rooms the ethics solution, the ventilated first aid, and the radiant panel. The second one is a two floor uh, building of 270 square meters each. The walls are made of reinforced concrete and solid bricks. Here we have installed the ethics wall, the ventilated first aid, and the uh, WGP wall. The third one is a residential care home for elderly people and disabled orphans. Uh, you can see in the picture the uh, principal stable is uh, those, uh, the big one with the uh, red roof, but uh, we have uh, uh, we intervene in the, uh, those uh, highlighted in red, that is a warehouse. Here we have installed the ethics solution in two different uh, area center walls. Uh, the first one uh, is a uh, residential house uh, in Pute Me near Mechelen. It, uh, it has a surface area of 170 square meters and uh, is a structural frame out of uh, wood walls uh, with a straw base of a 35 centimeter of thickness. Okay, here we are installed in a uh, room in the first floor, the ceiling, uh, ceiling radiant panel. And uh, I'm uh, going to start uh, with uh, some videos uh, to show you how the method of installation uh, first of the ATX panel. These are the HDG panels already explained by my colleagues. The material uh, required for the installation. We are, we are uh, installing the panel guide and uh, level it. The, uh, we secure the panel guide on the wall. We put the, um, the sealant uh, to the uh, APS to, to the HDG panel to install the APS strip to cover uh, all the parts of the panel. We put also the sealant uh, in the panel guide. We put uh, the sealant in the back of the APS. We install in the bottom panel in the guide and we level it and control if it's in level, otherwise we correct it.
we fix the installation. We we'll put the fixer and the spacer, the three millimeter spacer. We put the sealant in the uh, side where we will um, at, um, put the other panel. And we install the second panel closer to the first one. We level it. We install, start installing the second row. This is a trial, so we have only three panel of uh, explanation. And we put it in the middle. We level it and two hours later, we will uh, Put the sealant in the um, in the um, in the space where it needs, and we clean all, and that's the final solution. Here you can see as there are no thermal bridge in the installation with an infrared camera, and that's it for the first installation. Uh, here we can see the results of the installation of the demo site in Padova, in Vula, in Athens, and in Romania. The second video is uh, the installation of the ventilated facade with Alten UMA anchoring system. We start uh, with uh, the leveling of the anchor installation. <laughs> We drill in for anchor installation and we clean the holes. We measure the correct distance for anchor penetration for all the anchor that is needed. We inject into the holes the resin blue. We insert the anchor in the wall. Sorry, I realize now with my collaborator that uh, you see uh, you are uh, a bit late that my computer is. So. Uh, Julia, it is correct. It is delay, but uh, he, the people heard what you say. Don't, okay, don't worry. So, so I, I try to to see with the, in the computer of my collaborator where I and explain you all. Okay, we are inserting the anchoring. We put the glue. And this is the final result with the anchor. We level it. We take the measurement for the second line of wall and the top part of the first line. We level it. And after 90 minutes later, we install the panel. This is the panel result with the three panel install installation, four panel installation. This is the first one. And that's it. Okay. Here are the results of the uh, installation on in two demo sites in Bulliac Mania Athens in Greece and in the pilot, in pilot Padova demo site. 
Uh, for radio antenna installation, first of all, uh, we installed it in Italy and Belgium. Before to start uh, to the installation with the panel, we, have, uh, we adapted the thermal plant to the installation of a ceiling radiant panel. Then uh, we start with the installation of the structure. We install all the panels in the building, in the structure installed before, and we connect the pipes one between the other. The final results of the installation are in Pilot Padova demo site and in Belgium, you can see it. The first, uh, what we install is uh, the wood geopolymer panels. Here there is a, it's not a trial, here is what will, is the installation in, inside the office in Vula demo site. This is all the material we install. We we'll, uh, take all the measurements and we put the bottom bracket and take all the measurements needed. We secure the bottom bracket. We put the first panel. We measure the dimension of the rubber strip in all the lines. And we start with the installation of the rubber strip. We install the middle bracket holder. We put the first WGP row. We install all the first line. We start to take all the measurement for the second row installation, the rubber strip. And after the installation of the second row panel, we install the middle bracket cover. This is the final result of the installation of the wall. This was the situation before the installation, and this is what you can see after the installation of the WDP wall. Now I will start to present the monitoring system and performance system. First of all, uh, we have measure make measurement in the scenario area of Padova, where we have installed six thermal energy meters, Four for the four fan coils that were installed inside the building, one for the ceiling radiant panel, and one for the humidifier. Uh, one weather, we installed one weather station outside of the building, five temperature and humidity sensors, four inside the building in the four room and one in the in a, outside. Two heat flux meter, one in the attics room and one in the um, room beside the attic build, the attic room. And uh, we have installed the global temperature meter to make the comfort value uh, measurement in the three rooms where the panels were installed. 
for the ventilated facade, we have uh, installed the, uh, some uh, uh, relative humidity anemometer and air temperature in the cavity between the external, uh, external ventilated facade and the external wall of the building. And we have put the contact temperature in the surface of the uh, walls. For the pilot house scenario of Padua, that we have done uh, uh, ER measurement. We can see the um, distrib good distribution of temperature and that uh, no thermal bridge are present in the, in, the, in the wall after the installation of the panels. Here you can see that we have reduced the uh, U value from 0.49 to 0.20 and we have a 60% of reduction of um, transmittance. For the surface uh, temperature distribution is comparable to laboratory tested and here you can see the uh, ER uh, um, measurement done inside the pilot uh, demo site in the summer season. For the old city hall of Vula, uh, we have uh, put some uh, OBO uh, temperature and humidity sensor in the building. We have put the contact temperature on the surface of the wall. We put the air temperature, relative humidity sensor, and we put the heat fluximeter into the wall. And here we measurement, we measure that uh, we have a 86% of reduction from 3.10 to 0.43 of uh, transmittance of the wall where the attic was installed. For what, for what that concerns the ventilated facade, we have uh, installed uh, some contact temperature in the surface of the, of, uh, the building. We have put uh, air velocity and temperature sensor inside the cavity from the ventilated facade and external wall. And we have put the gas flux meter in the uh, wall uh, where the, uh, in the inside part of the existing wall. Here you can see as uh, after the installation of the ventilated facade, the comfort uh, increases. So uh, there is a less percentage of uh, people dissatisfied. And the predicting mean vote is uh, from uh, start from cold before the installation to slightly cold in the, uh, after the installation of the ventilated facade. The Donorione demo site, we have installed temperature and humidity sensor inside the, inside the room and outside. We have put the heat flux meter, we put an electrical energy meter, and we made a globe thermometer campaign to evaluate the comfort. Here uh, we have a reduction of 64% from 1.65 to 0.59 of transmittance of the wall. From the residential echo output, we have made some different uh, uh, things. We have put firstly the commercial panel and then the Inoue panel in order to, uh, to make some comparison between what exists in, uh, in our market and uh, our product. We have done a global thermometer campaign. We have put the temperature sensors inside and we have put the thermoproximeter in the um, in the, in the tubes of the plants. Here you can see as uh, uh, we can compare the commercial the comfort of the commercial panel, uh, the comfort of the room where the commercial panel were installed and where uh, the inner wheel panel were installed. Here you can see that we have a very similar uh, comfort situation. At, at the end, uh, we have done a durability, durability test. We made the test and visual inspection for more uh, for the um, walls where uh, we have installed for more than uh, one and a half a year the panels and uh, in a different climate condition. And uh, we um, the results show that the ethics and the ventilated facade exceed the required durability. The total cost of ownership uh, is estimated to be about 30% less than the traditional one. Overall conclusion, I can conclude to say that uh, we have a U-value reduction for, for ethics panel from 50 to 80%. We have uh, uh, the radiant ceiling performance similar to, uh, to the industrial one. We, have, uh, we know that the ethics and the ventilated facade reduce energy needs at the same level of the market products. 
we have an increase of the comfort after the installation of Inouye products. And we have a total cost of ownership estimated to be at least 30% uh, less than traditional ones. And for me, it's all. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, thank you, Julia, uh, as well. Interesting uh, presentation with the video, which explained uh, a lot. So now is the turn of uh, Beatrice uh, Fraga from Technalia, Spain, about building energy modeling and virtual demo sites. Uh, Beatrice, the floor is yours. So hello, everybody. My name is Beatrice Fraga. Thanks for the introduction, Emil. I work for Technalia as a energy efficiency engineer um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about building energy modeling for Innoe, which was the main task of Technalia in this project. Uh, firstly, I'm gonna give you an introduction to building energy modeling for those ones that they are not familiar with it. Uh, secondly, I will go through the methodology that we follow for 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 the models and at the end I will merge the innovative results and the conclusions. Uh, uh, this is a bit to to make to make all these presentations a bit more uh, understandable and enjoyable. Uh, building energy modeling is getting more and more commonly used among experts in the building uh, in the building design. Uh, the standard way of working used to be uh, firstly design the building, design the structure and after adjust the cooling and the heating demands. However, this way of working is not um, is not uh, it's not optimum for sizing systems as the it leads to oversized system and waste a lot of energy. Therefore, uh, actual and recent um, support decision tools uh, for building energy modeling help to perform simulation, predict energy needs and optimizing design a first stage of a project. Uh, I'll go through the methodology because uh, although uh, we apply, uh, the, all models have a different a different wall. Every model is different. Every building behaves very different. But the methodology behind is the same. So I think it's important to remark what's behind all the results. So first of all, we collect uh, the data for all buildings. So to fully to fully define our model with the 3D model needs all the features for the building. With all the features, I mean construction fabric, air tinets, internal gains, HVAC schedules, occupancy patterns, climate data uh, and surrounded shadows. So it's a lot of data and it's very important because the more data you have, the more precise your building will be. Um, once your model is ready and finished, you need to calibrate it. Uh, finishing the model is a long process, like we just summarized it in a in a nest, in one slide. But um, the, the, the next step is key. You need to calibrate the model to uh, match your building, your real building with uh, the model that you have on a computer. It is very, very common on commissioning stage having a performance gap between the real building, the, the operation of the real building and the uh, um, the model that you have on your computer. <laughs> so the, the the way to do that is to use uh, data, to use measured data. In the case of Innoe, we have collected the data that you uh, read, uh, had just explained, uh, which is um, meter readings and uh, monthly utility bills are uh, very um, are the key to to basically match. In these two figures, you can see uh, how we actually try to match. Uh, I will explain later with the demo sites. Behind this procedure, there is a common framework common framework to assess the energy performance. It is the international protocol for measurement and verification. Um, the next step is already the analysis. You can already now you can get started with the assessment. Your model is built, your model is calibrated. 
So now you can start building the scenarios you want to assess. In the case of uh, Innovi, we had a baseline period with the 16 building, and then we have a reporting period where the, uh, the solutions were uh, applied. Uh, in in the case, it's very it's very important to make sure that both scenarios have a similar uh, conditions in the sense, uh, for instance, weather is a very important parameter to take into account when you compare two scenarios as uh, with two scenarios of the retrofitting and the existing, because the weather has to be equivalent. You cannot compare one uh, uh, one one solution in a very colder year comparing with a milder year so another assessment that you can that we have carried out our sensitivity analysis those are very like energy modeling helps a lot with this procedure because you can change one parameter and see how this impact on your um on your energy, the energy demand of the building. In this case, uh, you can see the thickness of insulation. You will see also in the next slides with the demo sites, but uh, we assess how the uh, difference in the thickness have affect the energy demand of the building. Uh, the hydrothermal evaluation step is a very specific step to uh, assess the risk of condensation for ventilated facades. This could be indeed a different presentation uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a long process, uh, but as summarizes as we follow two main, uh, two main ways to, to carry out this evaluation. One was the one dimensional, where uh, we use a factor as a metric to evaluate, to, um, to, to assess the condensation risk. These factors depend on indoor conditions and climatology. Uh, the three dimensional way was actually included because of the thermal bridges. In this case, uh, in this way of doing the three dimensional one, you can take into account the thermal bridge bridges and how insulation affects also the anchor systems of the ventilated facades. Uh, for Innoe project, uh, they, no, they, they show no risk of condensation with this insulation. So now going to the results, the results of the project, right? Um, um, Italian pilot site, uh, as um, was previously explained, ethics ventilated facade were uh, uh, installed and the ethics show uh, a reduction of 80% of, um, of energy demand in the in winter, so in heating system, and 34% in cooling system. This high percentage in cooling system, to be honest, is just because the cooling loads are very low, so then it shows a very high percentage, but it's indeed neglectable. And uh, the annual, the winter season, it was like the the, the striking part of the results. Uh, in the case of ventilation facade, it's the same, but the reduction is, is slow, is, is as suspected, it is uh, lower as 1% reduction in winter. For the case of the Greek demo site in Vola, we have uh, assessed the ventilated facade in one room and the ethics panels in another room. And in the case of the ethics panels, uh, the annual energy reduction, uh, the annual energy demand reduced by 60.64% kilowatt hours year. Uh, in the graph, you can see the cooling, heating, lighting equipment decreasing. In the case of the ventilated facade, as in the previous case, the percentage was lower and we reduced the, we show a percentage of 2.4 uh, year. In, for Belgium, uh, we, as, as explained by Julia, we had a, a radiant ceiling installed, comparing it with a commercial panel. So then we can see uh, how, if they behave similar, uh, if they are having like similar um, outputs. And that was the case. After the constant weekly monitoring, 
we could see a resemblance between both type of radiant panels throughout the winter. So both systems meet the thermal conform, they both behave uh, um, similar and they both can meet the indoor conditions uh, required. For the case of the Romanian demo site, uh, there was an ethics uh, on one room that show 4.39, sorry, 4.39% annual reduction of the energy demand. Uh, in the case of the, thick, the, the sensitivity analysis that I was explaining previously, here uh, we could see how how affects. So if you you can reduce your thickness, you can increase your thickness, and then your energy demand will reduce. However, you are also paying uh, having a higher cost. So you need to find an equilibrium to find the optimum. In this case, we can see how the energy savings can can go up to 20% if you keep uh, increasing the uh, the thickness to nine nine centimeters. However, after seven centimeters, there is no payback uh, return period. Uh, now, after I just summarized the four real demo size. Additionally, we have made four virtual demo sites with four new results that <laughs> they don't fit uh, in a full presentation. But the idea was to have uh, another grid, uh, like the first, the, on the top we have the Spanish virtual demo site, on the, on the middle we have a Greek one, and then the, the Belgian and the Italian one. This was to have like a broader European scenario. So all the all the um, all the solutions that were not applied in the demo sites were applied in the virtual demo sites as a, as to in order to have the the same solution in the, a different solution. Sorry, in a, in the same climate. But we will see that in an overall conclusions. So as conclusions, I would like first to 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 take to get back to the building energy modeling as a um, as a um, decision support tool. This is very important, like to take into account this is a dynamic interaction between three main inputs: climate, building, and occupants. So the more precise you are, the better you calibrate, the better you you you, you put your inputs, the best uh, will be your model and the best will fit the real operation one, which is really important to create new uh, scenarios. Uh, so overall, the conclusions uh, are uh, for for humid subtropical oceanic oceanic and Mediterranean climates. Those are the demo sites included in this uh, project. The energy savings have been higher in Spain, Greece and Italy than in Romania with the passive solutions and ethics panels were the most beneficial solution for all locations. The ventilated facade uh, had a positive uh, impact, but ethics show a uh, better performance, especially through winter months. Um, cooling loads were neglectably affected but by adding insulation because uh, in warm climates uh, uh, that's the common effect. Then the radium panels uh, lead to decrease the energy needs uh, mainly because of the lower temperature distribution and also show be a competitive product, uh, particularly in temperate oceanic climate due to that comparison with a commercial one. So to finalize, I just want to remark that the use of building energy modeling in construction sector has come to meet the energy conservation and sustainability new requirements. So thank you for listening. Uh, hey, thank you, Bert. Thank you, Bert. Uh, very, very much. So, an energy performance of buildings uh, is a crucial aspect for tenants, owners, and if the building modeling is performed using the international protocols uh, for that, like in Inoue by Technalia, so we could be sure that uh, everything is good uh, implemented. So, now is the turn of uh, Friedrich Ness from Zak, Slovenia. 
to give the speech about uh, life cycle assessment. Frederic, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you see me and see my presentation. Yes, correct. Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Friedrich Nis. I come from the Slovenian National Building and Civil Engineering Institute, and I was in charge uh, of calculating and taking care of the life cycle assessment uh, of the Innovi products. Now, before we go into the details of the life cycle assessment done on the products, allow me just a few words about the LCA because maybe somebody is not entirely acquainted with, uh, with the, the topic. So life cycle assessment is part of the life cycle thinking, the broader, the broader um, aspect, uh, which has of course also been deeply integrated in all phases of the project um, and is related to sustainable construction. So the sustainable construction, as you know, uh, has several parts uh, and uh, also uh, environmental part is one of these. Uh, why are we doing the LCA? Because the LCA method provides, provides a sound and a consistent tool for the assessment of product and options and in particular to improve the production process. Um, but before we go uh, into the details, I must from the very beginning say one, one thing. The results in any analysis and also in this one cannot be entirely compared to other data because of methodological issues that there are and mainly connected with the definition of the system we are addressing and the equivalence of the products. So, um, the LCA as such consists of four stages. I will not go into details here, but the first one is um, goal and scope definition, uh, where we are uh, defining what we actually want to do. In our case, it was assessing the pilot production line and consider optimizations possible. Uh, so these are the two goals we are pursuing. Uh, the second stage is creation of life cycle inventory. We compose something that is called the bill of materials. Um, and transfer that to the life cycle inventory, meaning that we transfer descriptions such as maybe um, uh, waste brick into uh, appropriate data set. The third stage is life cycle impact assessment and the fourth stage is uh, interpretation where we in general want to see whether uh, our impacts are low, normal or high. This is the most simplified approach. Um, when it comes down to the uh, methodology implemented. It must be said that we have been following the EN 15804 standard for that, and we have been uh, dying, doing that for the whole life cycle. So it means that all modules A1 to D, this will this will be uh, coming around a few times more, uh, have been taken into account. Also, we have been um, discussing and and addressing the benefits beyond the system uh, system borders. I will not go into details here because it's too complex. But just to say at the beginning, um, we were uh, doing this according to the to the new proposal of the standard EN15804. Basically, split burdens between between the future benefits and and uh, benefits to the address to the to the to the current uh, product in question. So uh, we begin with the composing of, of the uh, life cycle inventory. Um, for that, we need the total composition. 13 individual constituents were, were taken from the bill of materials, as I said before. Uh, the electrical power and transport, transport water uh, are not shown here. Only, only materials are shown. Um, and by mass, we could uh, we could roughly say that uh, what we have analyzed, uh, this is an example for for uh, for ethics, um, was consisting of 38% of construction demolition waste, 22% of potassium silicate, 15% of metacaline, and 11% of slag, and others. So the the, the named materials consist of 87% of mass, which would suggest that um, it is um, already well defined if we know these four components, but the problem is that it is not. Because in the real case, when we are creating the life cycle inventory for the assessment, what happens is that we have to connect all the materials with the processes as seen here. And it turned out that, for example, we did not have appropriate data um, for metacaoline and potassium silicate. Also, we could not use the generic data for construction demolition waste. 
So for the first two, we had to do the so-called upstream modeling, meaning we had to go back to the producers of, to the sources of these materials, better to say than producers, and define and uh, see how these materials are actually produced and what are the burdens introduced to that. Um, this was uh, expected to the some extent. What was not expected during during the analysis that is that so the level of difficulty to obtain this data. But in the end, we managed that, and we are very proud of that because we have contributed with these two data sets, uh, which are uh, obviously now uh, available and and uh, accessible, also to promote use of um, geopolymers uh, using metacaulin and, pot and potassium silicate. Uh, for future solutions. As said, the modeling of, uh, of uh, upstream uh, processes uh, was already explained. This is uh, shown here uh, just uh, uh, how the construction demolition waste was assigned or transfer transformed into the life cycle inventory. You could see that that all of the individual entries were taken from the from the uh, from the equipment database, but the the composition and the exact percentages were sourced out of the uh, traced quantities during the project. This is one of the big advantages if you are involved as an LCA specialist in the designing of a product, you really know the, the uh, proportions. Otherwise, uh, in commercial work, um, we are often forced to yeah, somehow guess it. And then we come to the modeling itself. The modeling was done using um, latest uh, tools and latest data sets. Gabi was Gabi Professional was used uh, in this in this case 99.0 at 9.23 something I don't know exactly. Uh, and we used two databases. Now, for those who are specialists here, you will say, "Oh no, but this is not done. The databases should not be mixed." Yes, this is the ideal world, but in the real world, we had to mix. Um, the, both the, the Gabi professional data sets and Equinvent, but of course we took uh, uh, most possible care to have the same boundaries um, within submodels. Um, as I said, 15804 2012 plus A2 2019 was the modeling uh, tool and the modeling protocol. So we we jump to the results. Once the model uh, is done, um, I'm presenting here a few a few shots of a few outputs of the of the end re of, of the results. Um, you should know that this is a bunch of maybe 200 numbers, which don't tell a lot because if I say if I tell you 6.2 to the power of minus three, you would probably know nothing about it. I also don't. This is why we are using relative contributions fitted to to the to the purpose of the analysis. One thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to use the impact uh, dif different uh, different midpoint and endpoint um, methods, um, and uh, we have concluded that there is no big difference between, for example, CML and recipe. These two are mainly used in new latest standards. Some are used for some indicators; others are, uh, other are used for, for other indicators. But the point is that there is not much difference. What does it mean? It means that the uh, the modeling and the data and the, the everything, the, the, the whole work is consistent and is not really sensitive to how we are going to interpret and uh, interpret or not, not interpret, but we're going to uh, to transform the results of yeah flows to the impacts. Um, what we see here. Is the CML for for the for the three for the three uh, products uh, divided by by different uh, life cycle stages? A1 to A3 is the production phase, and then it follows all the way to the D, which is which is in fact uh, the uh, the the uh, benefits beyond beyond uh, end of life. What you see is most of the bars are blue, which means that for the most of the of the indicators. Actually, the production phase is the most important, but not for all. There are also some gray. If you look at the gray, the gray is A5. A5 is, uh, uh, is installation. Uh, and it means actually that those that, that, have, that have gray uh, overwhelming, uh, me, uh, we have to look, look a little bit more closer to that. Yes, it, may, it, may, it makes sense. It is, for example, in abiotic depletion potential elemental. 
because we are using material which has a lot of secondary materials um, embodied, it means that the, the depletion of virgin materials is low. Therefore, it is easy to, for other materials to prevail. In fact, I will not show that in detail, but in fact, uh, the ADP uh, elemental potential is compared to, and I'm now by, biting my tongue because I said I will not compare, um, is several times lower than in normal uh, or in standard products because of high content of, of uh, recycled material. Um, the same also goes for human toxicity potential because that's the HTP, because uh, these are not, not really um, present in the, in the uh, materials as such. In, in all other uh, indicators, the, the production phase is dominant. Now, when we know that we have to focus in the production phase, we go to look deeper. What inside the production phase are the hotspots in which we can, um, we can optimize the production? And it turns out, I'm, I'm sorry, in the middle graph, the red is the blue. So uh, it's, it's always the electricity. Uh, it turns out that the electricity makes the highest contribution. Now, how is that possible? Well, if when we go to the uh, to the um, deeper to, to the model, we see that electricity is used also for for uh, for heating water. This is this makes a lot of sense from the from the point of production production plant, the pilot plant. These are the data for the pilot plant. Um, but in, in, in general, if we, are, we have a brownfield or even greenfield investment, uh, this is certainly something we have to look, look in. Then the second source, uh, besides electricity, uh, where, where we could look, look uh, of possible uh, improvements, are the potassium silicate and metacholine, but these are key constituents of the, of the geopolymer, and it is very, very difficult to say it is possible to change those. Maybe we have, we have traced some data that uh, that recycled metacholine exists. It is possible to to get it, but we did we were not successful in finding it. How it, uh, so? This this is this is more like um, like a theoretical option in this case. This is why we concentrate to the electricity. Now usual stuff. Electricity uh, in in the EU grid. You are using we are using grid. It consists of about 50% of energy from thermal power plants. Um, most of electricity in, in our production, in pilot production, is used for water heating uh, and also for, for, for curing uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the product uh, and is not yet optimized. By the way, uh, there is a paper on LCA analysis. If somebody wants to download it, it's open access, so it's easy to, to get it and check also other results because it's more results uh, there shown. When we go to the further what if scenarios, as was shown also before in energy, when we play what we can do, we have actually gone through four scenarios, four options, what one could do in the electricity uh, in the later scale up of the, of the product. So the baseline is the electricity, of course, because baseline is always zero, it is not shown on the graphs. Then we had four options. Option one, we use natural gas as energy source for heating. Option two, grid electricity driven high temperature heat pump for producing heat from the, from the, uh, from the power. Um, this is a little bit tricky, but it's possible because the temperature levels are OK, uh, so, so it, could, it could be used. The third one is employing solar energy and using vacuum tube solar collectors for heat generation. We, again, we need hot water. And then the fourth one is kind of a radical not only the, the vacuum tube solar collectors introduced, but also photovoltaics uh, system is, is introduced in the plant because currently the, the plant is in, uh, in Greece and it seems logical option. Of course, if the plant is elsewhere, this has to be taken, taken into the consideration. These are the scenarios that are possible. Then the second impact that is also um, very, very uh, important is that uh, we also have long uh, distances to travel for the for the materials because this this was the project for example the construction demolition waste travel uh, roughly 200 to 2000 kilometers which would never happen in real life 
Metacarlin uh, traveled 5,000 kilometers. And obviously, if we reduce these, uh, these distances to the local level to 200 kilometers, we get like 80% reduction. I forgot to say, uh, to say before what are the reduction. For example, um, in global warming potential, this is the previous slide, in global warming potential in option four, we can reduce like 80% uh, of global warming, uh, warming potential. Uh, this is probably maybe the, the, most, the most significant one. So, the, so also in, on, the, on the emission sites, uh, large, large uh, savings are possible. And uh, for actually for, for the final thing, again, biting my tongue, um, comparison with commercial products, but this is methodologically not correct. But what we could have shown is that um, at least the products uh, after the upscaling can be, yeah, I will be bold, can be better than average products on the market, competitive products on the market, certainly on the better half, uh, but, but also uh, it is estimated, I estimated like in terms of global warming potential, maybe 30% lower in terms of uh, abiotic depletion potential several times lower, meaning maybe 60, 70, 80%, depending a lot of a baseline. This is why this is so difficult to say how exactly. Um, the analysis has proven really potential, uh, potential to reduce emissions to, to those levels. Uh, even further, the, 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 the option with, with uh, reducing the distances here is not even shown, but, but it, it, from, the, from the option four, uh, uh, it really halves the emissions still. So it's, it's, really, it's really lower. And the final, the conclusions. So I must say I'm happy and proud of the work that we have done because it is really a complex LCA analysis of full life cycle no modules omitted um, and uh, we had to, to, to do the upstream modeling which contributes to, to the secondary results of the project also uh, useful for other projects. Uh, the LCA certainly shows promising results. I don't want to say here explicitly the percentages as said several times before, but certainly shows promising results and possibilities for the products to be better. After the optimization, it is realistic to expect comparable or better results as found in commercial products. And the last one, this is not directly connected to the to the uh, to the LCA, but it connects to the first slide to the life cycle thinking. People are still skeptical about the use of building materials with high content of recycled materials. This was also mentioned by Daniel and the very uh, no, no, very on the second presentation. Studies in this area are. Uh, also important to generate enough data and help persuading the general public about usefulness of, of, uh, of these solutions. Thank you very much. This was all from my side. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, the life cycle is assessment. I would like to underline that uh, cover all the aspects during uh, this kind of the project or during uh, development uh, project. So you have the the chance to see how how is is the important to perform this uh, in the adequate uh, way. So now is the turn of Sabina Donalek uh, from Zak uh, as well, Slovenia to give the presentation about the certification and standards. Sabina, the floor is yours. It's OK. Thank you, Emil. Thank you, uh, Emil, for the introduction. Hello to everybody. I'm Sabina Dolinac from Slovenia National Building and Civil Engineering Institute. Um, today, I will briefly present some aspects on the use of uh, secondary raw materials in construction products and uh, standardization of new products. Of course, if we are developing and produce new products, we are also interested what are possibilities on their marketing. Uh, performance of construction products, which also includes products from recycled materials, is covered by the construction product regulation. And uh, CA marking is uh, mandatory for products where a harmonized product standard exists. Um, this can be an issue for new or innovative products uh, which are not 
covered uh, by harmonized European standards. Standards are not developed yet. And um, when using secondary raw materials in construction products, key questions and dilemmas are usually what is waste, what is byproducts, or when certain waste ceases to be waste, which is the relevant le legislation, etc. In general, when we have a production process and residuals resulting from primary operation, uh, not direct, directly usable residuals are defined um, as a waste, while directly usable residuals are defined as byproducts. That means that it can be used uh, without further processing, so no further processing is needed. Um, here in the table, construction uh, demolition waste uh, used uh, for INOV products are listed. Uh, all uh, those materials are classified as non-hazardous waste, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, since uh, construction and demolition waste need further process, for instance, crushing to be used as an aggregated filler, it's a classification as byproduct. It's not likely if uh, we would like uh, to do that, for instance. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I cannot move to the next slide. Something uh, is wrong or. So Sabina present in the edition mode. Please. Mm -hmm. ah, now, now it goes. Now it OK, goes. now it's working. Yes. Perfect. A little delay, uh, I guess. Uh, those aspects are covered in legislation or regulation on waste on one hand, so you see it on your uh, left, and uh, legislation on materials, products on other hand. Um, in your left, main important documents related to the waste management at European level are listed, such as Waste Framework Directive, Landfill Directive, etc. Um, for instance, uh, work uh, Waste uh, Framework Directive uh, uh, defines main concept on the waste, recycling, disposals, requirements and obligations for handled uh, waste and not to have negative impact on the human health and environment. On your right, uh, main documents relating um, to products regulation are listed, such as uh, uh, construction uh, product regulations and reach. CPR allows a comparison of performance of products from different uh, manufacturers in different countries, uh, providing us um, a common technical uh, language. Uh, so, when uh, classified as a waste, environmental and health, health protection aspects of the use of uh, materials or certain materials for construction purposes are regulated uh, by European and uh, national waste legislation, uh, such as the Waste Framework Directive. Uh, but when waste uh, ceases to be waste, it becomes a product. And in that uh, uh, moment, the use of uh, the material for construction purposes will be regulated uh, um, by legislation of products, which is uh, CPR uh, and um, REACH. Uh, as um, uh, when a material uh, or waste material cease to be waste after processing into products and when uh, fulfill the number of uh, uh, specific criteria and it has to be noted that uh, recycled materials must fulfill the same technical requirements as conventional materials so the important things are uh, properties um, in addition of course there are also other aspects among them being um, uh, that uh, those uh, products uh, uh, or from recycled materials they do not have possess no negative environmental impact uh, or uh, no uh, having no negative health impact uh, <clears throat> as uh, concerns construction products a CPR identifies a number of by basic requirements uh, that shall be met uh, by products used in construction work. As seen here, there are seven of them. Uh, they also include uh, hygiene, health and environment, as well as sustainable use of natural resources. Uh, and uh, those basic requirements are related to essential characteristics, 
characteristics and performance of construction products and those essential characteristics are uh, uh, defined uh, uh, in uh, harmonized standards or other technical specifications such as uh, European assessment document, etc. And um, those essential characteristics which are very important for certain product, um, they characterize it, are usually given, are given in uh, the annex of the um, technical documentation. Uh, to, to, for instance, for ethics, uh, important uh, uh, characteristic are water absorption, impact resistant, uh, reaction to fire, etc. <clears throat> Uh, what about marketing of uh, construction products? Um, if we have new or innovative products, uh, first uh, we need uh, to check if uh, harmonized standard exists. And if yes, uh, then this is quite easy and CA marking is obtained based on a uh, harmonized uh, standard. But uh, <sighs> where new products are not in the scope of any harmonized standards, C um, E marking uh, can be uh, obtained on a European technical uh, assessment or uh, at national level marketing is possible via uh, national technical approvers. And uh, we know that in case of InnoV products, um, uh, we have some uh, uh, European standards that are uh, for similar products, but not for uh, those products which were developed uh, in the frame of the project. And uh, of course, these uh, two options are more time consuming, but uh, facilitate uh, the marketing of uh, non -standard, uh, standardized innovative products on market. Of course, developing new standards take much, much more time. Uh, and uh, I would like to mention also this that um, uh, while harmonized standards and ETA um, are a harmonized sector, which means that the process of uh, uh, creating common standards across internal market, but uh, national technical approval are non-harmonized uh, sector and uh, means that uh, they are under uh, national um, rules. Uh, those um, manufacturer, manufacturers can obtain CA marking um, via uh, European technical assessment, which is issued uh, uh, based on the European assessment uh, document, EID. Uh, assessment is done uh, by defining a list of essential characteristics, uh, which uh, I mentioned before, with associated assessment and verification of uh, constancy of performance, AVCP. And uh, what is this? Uh, AVCP system is a harmonized system, system defining um, how to assess products and control uh, the constancy of the assessment of um, results. There are five different systems ranging for from large scale third party involvement to self declaration and monitoring by the producer. For instance, we have system one plus one, uh, two, three and four uh, um, <clears throat> ranging from more strict to let's say a less uh, strict. Uh, for instance, for system one plus uh, audit testing of samples by notified uh, body is predicted. This uh, is for cement usually system four. Uh, in system four notified uh, body it's not included. These are for instance uh, ceramic tiles in this system. Uh, and um, when uh, fulfill uh, AVCP uh, declaration of performance is issued with all relevant information on intended use of a certain products, performance, um, etc. And uh, finally, CA marking uh, is obtained, which means that a manufacturer has taken uh, responsibility for the pro uh, product as stated in this uh, declaration of a performance document. And um, just to mention also um, national technical approvals, um, this is also an option for the products which are um, not in, uh, included in any harmonized technical specification. And um, 
a construction um, product can be placed uh, on the market in particular member states. Uh, and uh, those um, particular requirements may differ among uh, the countries. Uh, this, uh, when uh, this is issued, it also the document uh, contain essential characteristic, intended use of the product, uh, control plan needs to be uh, defined, etc. But um, in this case, uh, uh, CR marking, uh, uh, it's not obtained uh, via this procedure. So, uh, thematic uh, is quite complex. Uh, sometimes many open questions left the, uh, the uh, those um, case by case approach um, it would be needed uh, in uh, these uh, um, options. So, uh, just briefly to show you uh, the problematic uh, when we are dealing with uh, new products or even when we need we would like to use uh, waste okay thank you for your uh, attention okay uh, thank, uh, you, thank you sabina, sabina for, for your, your presentation, presentation about, about uh, standardization. standardization we have, we have uh, everything uh, clear, clear that, that uh, if you know, know certification no success of on the, on the market. On the market. Uh, now and is the now time, is time for the uh, question answer uh, session and we have one question to Friedrich. Uh, uh, I will read them. Uh, Echo, Vent, Echo Invent database as well as Gabi database are quite limited in terms of the newly developed materials. Then I imagine that some of the data has been properly estimated. If yes, if yes, how was it performer? So, Frederick, please give yeah. very, very short yeah. feedback to, the, to that. Yeah, th yeah. Thank you. Th thank you for the question. Indeed, uh, the databases are huge, but still they miss a lot of a lot of information, in particular for new materials. As I said, we had to upstream model two two constituents, which means that we um, we took the literature, we we took the the information from the producers, from the specific producers, as far as they were they were uh, able to give it to us uh, and uh, compose the sub models i did not show the sub models but but based on the data on on description of their process the temperatures the energy the constituents etc we were able to 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 uh, upstream model the the subsets so so to say to sabina is there a way for inoe consortium to influence development of standard eid for geopolymers and the next part of the question, do you have any ideas? Is, is, is mind a little bit uh, gra grammar uh, loss? It is uh, critical to obtain the CA mark. I'm right. Sabina, if you could address this very quickly, please. Yes, yes. Actually, consortium um, was uh, or is in contact with the European Committee for uh, Standardization wow. because uh, um, we have uh, our uh, experts involved in TC or working group uh, there. Um, it's, um, I think, still under debate if uh, alkali activated materials will be part of the TC or some particular working groups under uh, other uh, TC, for instance, for concrete or cement. Um, it's uh, hard to say how long this will take or would take uh, uh, because personally I don't have uh, experiences on that, but uh, I can say for ISTM standards it goes uh, quite quickly. Um, <clears throat> I would like uh, to point it out that uh, we are also involved in a RILAM uh, TC, uh, which they um, uh, deal with alkali activated materials and also colleagues there are quite active to address this issue about standardization of uh, this kind of products. Uh, at this particular Innovi products, uh, I think uh, more convenient would be uh, to start uh, with uh, it um, uh, issuing, but uh, this needs to be done by the manufacturer. Ma manufacturer. Oh, okay. I hope I uh, answered. Yes, I think, I think you give the feedback uh, very clearly. Uh, thank you, Sabina. 